Hello, the payments industry worldwide is undergoing uh, tremendous activity, uh, although we should not be in a hurry to call any of them um, specific trends uh, that are going to define the future of payments. We have at the wholesale level, um, you know, central bank uh, digital currencies, which are still work in progress uh, in a number of parts of the world, by the way, and, and some of which have already undergone pilot schemes uh, from which we do need to uh, make some preliminary conclusions. Um, and then at the retail end, at the financial inclusion layer, um, you know, you have M-Pesa, you've got a number of different peer-to-peer -peer platforms. And today's interview is focused specifically uh, with the Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia, Chair Sari, uh, on her pet project, which is Bakong, um, which she describes as being a peer-to-peer -peer platform. In order to appreciate this interview, uh, you need to understand a couple of things about Cambodia. Firstly, it is a crowded market despite being a small and developing market. It's a market with 50 banks. Um, almost anyone who wants a banking license and who can afford the capitalization required uh, can get a banking license. And then you have uh, microfinance institutions, a couple of them actually being global best practice um, in, as, as microfinance players. And then you have um, about 20 uh, payment systems players or payment systems providers who already dominate uh, the payments infrastructure in Cambodia. And with all this, all, all these as being the players, uh, it's also a market where two currencies um, are, you know, sort of why for um, legitimacy, the US dollar and the domestic real. So uh, you need to have all of these at the back of your mind uh, as you listen to how uh, Chair Sari describes the development of the payment infrastructure in Cambodia. Actually, um, this is probably one of the first times um, I think we're going to have you describe the project uh, for people outside of Cambodia. Just give us a landscape um, of the payments landscape and then put in context the Batkong story for us. If you already have something that is um, stable and efficient, uh, you wouldn't want to disturb with something new and untested uh, elsewhere. Very good. And Very that's good. exactly what a lot of country asks, why is it that Cambodia, a small country, is um, launching this uh, ahead of some of the developing countries who already been doing a lot of studies on this? And my answer is that that's because we have nothing that is going on well. And so bringing it in, project like Bakong would, um, and in the best case scenario, would help. Um, if not, then uh, we can easily pull it off without disturbing um, anything that is going on in the market. Also in terms of our whole financial sector landscape, it's, it's quite fragmented. Um, we have the banking sector there where they're doing pretty much anything or everything. Um, and then we've got 70, 80 microfinance institutions. Um, and the small microfinance can lend, but they can't take deposit. Um, and then we've got the payment service providers. Uh, they are about 20. They can only provide payment instrument to the user. Uh, they can't take deposit. All the wallet flow that they collected and need to be deposited in a financial institution are 100% guaranteed. So they can't use that wallet flow to do lending or anything else. In 2019, we had the first payment service provider uh, in the country um, and it was Wing. Um, what was well known back then was uh, M-Pesa in Kenya. And when Wing was introduced in the country, it was an, an sort of like an experimental project. It was launched by um, the uh, Australian ANZ group. Um, and, and, and the idea is to promote financial inclusion through, through this kind of uh, um, services and trying to emulate M-Pesa in a way. And I think the first reaction from, from regulator, and at that time I was with the banking supervision, and my reaction was that, well, if you are taking money from the public, you are a bank and you need to be regulated as such. So we come up with a tiered regulation. Initially, we allowed this company to operate with 100% guaranteed by a licensed bank because the idea is that we don't understand this animal, um, but we know it's going to be good for this industry. And so we, we asked a 
banks to regulate or to on our behalf to sort of uh, manage uh, the risk of these uh, payment service provider. And eventually we come up with a licensing criteria and license this payment service provider independently from the banks. Um, and so this payment service provider then bloom uh, in the country, many more come and 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 and, and got their license, um, and and actually was quite widespread, and people were very interested in that. Um, it usually uh, operate through mobile phone, and mobile phone penetration in Cambodia is already very high uh, compared to uh, the population. So we have about 20, 21 million mobile phone subscription for a population of about sixteen and a half. Um, so it, it was actually a very good medium for people to access formal financial services. So they go through this payment service provider to send money from uh, the urban area to the rural area where any small shop can act as a, a cash dis disbursement um, center for, for this payment service provider. So then different sort of um, institutions operate independently from each other. So for banks, uh, banks that have mobile banking app, um, it would usually be for their own customer base. Um, if you want to do a cross institution money transfer, uh, you have to have a bilateral agreement with the other institution. So privately, uh, they will go and negotiate uh, the terms and conditions, then only the, their customer can send money across. And so what the National Bank of Cambodia first introduced was a fast system which allow a um, account to account money transfer. So this is this was in a basic infrastructure um, meant for banks um, trying to connect account to account cross institutions. So every bank would just have to connect to the central bank fast system. Um, it's a centralized system and then uh, they don't have to do bilateral negotiations um, and then their customer can do uh, account to account transfer regardless of the institution of the beneficiaries um, uh, the beneficiary bank with right. uh, and then what we realized is that um, we made it happen for banks but we were actually excluding the payment service provider because they didn't have bank account per se they were holding wallet but those are not bank account so there's a disconnect right between um, the bank and the, the payment service provider, but also a disconnect between urban and rural, right? And, okay. and the idea behind our project is how can we connect them together? And so we were exploring different um, infrastructure and then bearing in mind that we don't have at the moment in Cambodia an RTGS system yet. We were also taking into account the fact that when we first launched FAST system, which is the basic infrastructure for bank to connect with each other, was real time for customer, although the banks will have to wait uh, for the settlement in the bank settlement two times a day. And okay. so what we relied was that the banks will have to provide a convenient user interface, right? By creating a mobile app for their user to 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 do those kind of transactions and what happened is that the banks didn't do that so as a customer if i want to do to transfer money to somebody else i will still have to walk to the bank counter and perform that transaction and even right. though it's real time it was inconvenient so we realized that we needed to a universal app that everyone can adopt uh, right because we can't wait on banks to do that because i can provide it many infrastructure, but then if the user interface is not there, then it's not going to work. For interbank transfer, you have FAST, which incidentally, it's local currency, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of the economy is uh, also dollar. Um, do you have a, a interbank yeah. clearing system for dollar? Yeah, so we, we have US dollar interbank clearing system sitting at the central bank. The FAST system was um, allow for only local currency. Um, what we are, we were trying to do is to differentiate convenience. It's all about convenience. If people um, find that transacting in local currency is more convenient to US dollars, then perhaps they would, you know, switch to use more local currency. And you unfortunately, know, it didn't happen. As you build the back end for the interbank, um, you are also trying to solve the problem of the back end 
for the interbank and the payment system players. Why is that the central bank's job? Um, you know, um, shouldn't it be shouldn't that, it be that? Um, you know, it, it's, um, the connectivity is something that the payment system players uh, should be uh, should be negotiating on their own with their respective banks or something like that. It's a good thing that you have a woman at the helm. <laughs> I've been looking at it as a parent taking care of their children. And obviously you want your children to be independent and do things on their own, right? And if it's not happening, you need a bit of push, right? And that's exactly right. what we did with the system, with the industry. We have dialogue with them. We said, look, we, we have a fast system. Why are you not using it? Why are you not yeah. you know, facilitating the end user yeah. with mobile applications? Yeah. And of course, they will come to you with a lot of excuses. When we announced that we're going to do this project, um, we called the industry and we explained to them, look, we're going to do this. Um, and um, this is how it's going to work. Uh, we need your support. And that's when the banking industry realized that they need to be doing something. Otherwise, the regulator will be doing everything. Um, so in a way, it's, it's kind of help. But the intention is not really to compete with the private sector, but to tell them that this is something that you need to be doing innovation and also stimulate some of the innovations in, in the industry. Yeah. Um, and, and also what, what we <coughs> done was to actually bring connect the payment service provider into the FAST system. And as there are some uh, technical issues and some um, regulatory uh, uh, barriers as well. One is that um, we have to identify account, right? Not wallet. Um, and so there's going to be quite a challenge for us to reconcile that, to, that together. Second is that when, if I were to include the PSP into the clearinghouse of the FAST system, it means that the payment service provider will have to follow the liquidity management rules of a bank because we don't have an RTGS system. Uh, banks have a settlement account with the central bank. They have to monitor it on a daily basis. They have to have credit line with the central bank just for the settlement purposes. If I were to do this with a PSP, then I would have to require them to have the same level of liquidity management as I would require from a bank. So they, that's when, you know, the uh, Bacon project came about where it's peer to peer. So um, I, I don't have to worry about uh, PSP managing their settlement account. Um, they, if they want their customer to use, um, they just have to have enough balance and the customer can only send if they have balance on their wallet themselves. So in a way, it take away all these, you know, um, of, of, of regulatory challenges. Mm. The thing that is that needs to be captured in this conversation is that the the ambitions of the PSPs, right? Uh, were they trying to become banks eventually? Which direction were they going into? Were they going into financial services or were they going into uh, platforms as a business. What was the evil that you were dealing with? And also, what you're saying is that Bakum becomes a wallet in itself. Uh, doesn't that get into competition with all the other wallets that are... That means it, it sort of ends the wallet game uh, once and for all. Um, so, first to your questions, what are the ambition of the PSP? Um, I, I don't know what their ambitions are, but the rules were clear. You can become a bank if you provide three um, services um, combined. So deposit taking, credit, any form of credit, and pro provision of a uh, payment instrument and the processing of that set payment instrument. We design our licensing in such a way that payment service provider would only keep doing the payment part. Um, so they can't do credit. And that's why when I mentioned about the flow right, of the wallet, um, the balance that they collect from the, 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 the customer must be deposited in a bank account um, and 100% of it must stay there. They can't use it for, um, for lending purposes. Mm -hmm. um, then banks are the ones who are doing intermediaries of these uh, money. We make sure that these wallets balance don't get any interest. Um, that's to make people understand that your wallet is not a saving. But in terms of payment, there are many things they can do. Um, of course, they can help microfinance to collect. So it's just not money transfer. You've restricted their business to only the fee on the transfers that they make. I, I don't know if that makes it less interesting for them. 
uh, or even commercially viable. Can all of these payment players uh, onboard Bakong uh, onto uh, their, their respective apps? Yes, definitely they, they all can. It would actually force them to compete with each other in a much more meaningful way. It's not just customer acquisition because ultimately cost, any customer can uh, send money to your customer, right? You can't restrict it anymore if you become a backlog account. Um, but I think the, the, the competition would then be focused on the quality of the services, the affordability um, and, and, you know, the, the options of services that you can offer. Um, and, and I think um, from that perspective, it's, it will be much better for the end users. Um, in terms of um, the central bank or Bakong project competing with the payment service provider. There are many options and I think a lot of the time the public confused that Bakong is just a wallet. Um, but we mentioned in our white paper, it's a backbone payment system. Um, the wallet uh, is not the, um, the ultimate service. This is more right. like a byproduct of it. You say backbone service, but uh, you have several backbone services. You've got FAST, you've got the National Clearing System, um, and then you've got Bakong. And, and I think recently you are introducing something called Retail Pay. You describe Bakun as an infrastructure. Uh, you have several infrastructures. So, um, you know, um, which aspect of the infrastructure does Bakun play? A lot of the existing infrastructures that we're having, um, except for FAST, um, it's not a 24-7 retail pay, it's not a 24-7 infrastructure. Um, there's a limited time to it, but Bakong in particular can complement the 24-7 um, the part because it's peer-to-peer, -peer. it doesn't need any clearing and settlement from the central bank part. Second is that the other infrastructures that we had in place, um, the um, payment service provider uh, were not included. Um, it was specifically designed for the banking system. Um, and Bakong is the one that link everyone together. Um, so the retail pay that we, we are going to launch is an enhancement of the existing FAST system. From a bank, they could use FAST system. Uh, where the amount can go higher. So it's it's not really a gross settlement, but um, the cap is higher than if it were to be transacted through the uh, Bakong system. Also, because Bakong provide a universal app, banks that don't have existing mobile application for their users, especially smaller banks, can actually uh, free riding on our one um, and, and have their customer use that. Once the banks are integrating with the uh, with the backbone system, for me as the end user, it doesn't matter whether the 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 the, the, the transfer is through backbone or fast. What we bring along with this uh, backbone is also a standardized QR code, uh, where every bank's app in the country can read each other. You, this, I think this backbone is being described uh, in, in outside of Cambodia as a. Uh, Central bank um, digital currency. Is it a central bank digital currency already or is it just an account, an accounting system at the moment? I never describe this project as a central bank digital currency. I always describe in many of my interviews that it is, it is a backbone payment system using the DLT um, technology. I mean, technology wise, because it's peer to peer and is issued by the central bank, therefore people think it's a central bank digital currency. It is quasi and it's not exactly what a central bank digital currency is supposed to be. For instance, um, it is not a token based, it is account based. We don't gain any uh, seniorage from issuing it. Uh, we're not adding anything new to this. It's a personal peer-to-peer -peer account managed at the central bank. Then the question is, um, how does the distributed ledger come in? Or unless it validates peer-to-peer -peer or something. And also distributed yeah. ledger is not well developed yet. So, you know, is there a need for that? And what we're using is a closed loop technology. So that's mean, um, and unlike many DLT where it's really genuinely distributed where the public can actually come in and validate the transaction. We can't do that in a financial system. Uh, you need some, uh, you know, uh, confidentiality, privacy, and then you need to, to safeguard the, the integrity of the system. As well. So you're giving people who do not have a bank account some form of identity 
yeah. some form of um, uh, you know uh, um, uh, 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 confirmation uh, uh, non repudiation of transaction that's that's actually what you're you're providing you know um, but the, then the million dollar question is is dlt even necessary for that personally i'm not even interested whether it's dlt or blockchain or whatever you call it it doesn't really matter what matters is i've got something that i want to solve and this mm. technology happened to be there and i'm just going to use it and whatever you call it it, it doesn't really matter yeah. And to go back to your question is that it's a closed loop. So the central bank actually is the one validating all the transaction. Uh, there's already competition on the Q QR part uh, in Cambodia. In fact, uh, the good news is uh, Cambodia is a bigger user of QR code than many developed countries right now. And there are banks like ABBA Bank that have um, you know QR codes there. I mean, they, they dominate that, that, that space. Uh, so are you saying that all payment players now have to use the you know the Bakong QR code. I just want to specify Bakong allowed interoperability among the different players um, in in our financial system. When it comes to the QR code, um, at the moment different banks have or different payment service provider have their own proprietary QR standard. So if I have let's say like you mentioned uh, ABBA uh, mobile applications. Uh, I won't be able to read the QR code of a payment service provider. It probably can read it, but it wouldn't know where the destinations, where are the beneficiaries. What we're trying to do is to bring all these together. And at, at the end of the day, it, it's about convenience to the end users. If you want to promote people to come into the system and use the system, you have to make it easy and frictionless and affordable. Um, that's that's how you promote you know, um, the unbanked to come into the banking system. Part of it is, of course, interoperability and make it easy for people to uh, to use it. And QR code, it wasn't the the, the things that come with Bakong, but I think because we already have Bakong and we thought, you know, if we were to add something, uh, QR code can 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 add on the uh, the Bakong. Something that a lot of people outside of Cambodia may not appreciate is the highly competitive and highly entrepreneurial nature of financial services in a small country. You've licensed all these different types of players to give access to um, you know, uh, a population that is largely ru rural and highly migrant. Uh, and on top of that, um, the, um, the, the, the per payment uh, amount tends to be um, small. Right, and uh, so you need to build infrastructure that is both ubiquitous and and cost efficient. And you're a central banker that's actually creating an infrastructure and saying this is interoperability. All of you come on on my platform, and and then you can play with each other. Um, what will probably re re result from that uh, is that it will change the landscape of the payment service providers in 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 Cambodia. It might actually consolidate them. Only fewer will survive because their income streams are narrowed. You'll have one or two which will scale, and and then the rest will not. Is that something that you you might see as being a inevitable consequence of creating Bakong? I I think um, a lot of the payment service provider right now they're um, betting on building their customer base. Um, the more they bring in, uh, the better it is, because then you preserve that customer base, right? And they'll keep using your service, um, which is good. Um, but with Bakong coming into play, um, now it's not just about building your customer base, but you also have to think about the quality and the affordability of your services. I mean, competition is going to be tough for the payment service provider. It's going to be a much more meaningful competition. And it's capitalism, right? The big fish will eat the smaller one. That's that's how it is. Um, so yeah, it's uh, competition is going to be tougher. When you take the commercial uh, payment platforms like WeChat or Alipay, these were funded by venture capital, billions of dollars of several years of free service um, and marketing and so on, and then you build a critical mass. Is that, do you see that you need to invest in Bakong in order to be become that? You know, you're a central bank, you may not have thought about the amount of um, investments needed to make something a uh, platform. And isn't that in competition with all the others? Um, you know, and, and, um, and you need to mandate free service perhaps or absorb costs and so on. When you do that, you're actually destroying the the payments um, industries 
um, you know, um, revenue model. Uh, you know, they, they need to recreate the revenue model from there. Bakong doesn't exist on its own. It exists on the, um, the back of the existing players, right? So as the National Bank of Cambodia, we don't go on and do advertisement and customer acquisition. These lay with the financial institutions, right? And the financial institution and the payment service providers um, who embed backbone into their existing application. Um, so so we, we exist in a way through that. Um, in terms of us uh, destroying the, uh, the payment uh, service providers, right? I, I think by creating interoperability, it shouldn't destroy them. It should actually strengthen them, right? I'm, I'm providing them an, an access for their existing customer base to everyone else. So let's say if I'm a client of a payment service provider, currently I can only send money to those who have uh, account with that same payment service provider. Exceptionally, if my service provider has a bilateral agreement with a the bank, then I can send to that bank as well. Yeah. Now what I'm providing them is an access to any other customer from any other financial institutions and payment service providers. So they should take it as an advantage. Next, as I said, what else can you add beyond, beyond the transfer? What else can you add for the user? So I will keep staying with you if, as I said, if it's cheaper, it's more convenient, et cetera, I will, keep, I will stay with you. Um, but if it's not, I'll move to somebody else because at the end of the day, if I'm a company, I, it doesn't matter where my employee is having an account with, I can still do the payroll uh, without having to worry, you know, it has to be the same institution, et cetera. Um, and, and again, I, I, I stress on the facts that interoperability shouldn't kill competition. Competition should, should use that and, and make it more meaningful. You know, this, this whole conversation is uh, fascinating. Uh, because um, what China is trying to do now is to reverse engineer uh, what you are trying to do from a, on a commercial basis. Um, in China, the, the platforms um, had, um, had become uh, ubiquitous. They, they created the national infrastructure. And now the, banks, the banking system is trying to pull it back in. Uh, and actually, the, the so-called um, central bank digital currency is to... Um, is to bring the, the, the relationship back uh, into the banking system, as it were. Now, and, and what you're doing is you're trying to say that, uh, you know, the, all of the players out there can be, uh, can be as they are, uh, but you're going to start with the banking system, you know, and the central bank owning the, the platform, the QR code, the app, the, and, and the money in the account. Um, you know, and um, uh, I can't imagine how... Uh, your approach uh, is going to build um, without uh, a profound change in the way that payments um, evolves in Cambodia. You're actually appointing the, the PSPs to become the marketing agent for Bakong now. You know, in other words, uh, the more they onboard Bakong, then you become successful. You know, um, now the reason I'm asking all these questions uh, is also because um, many countries are thinking about the, the huge dynamics between um, you know, venture capital funded payments infrastructure built on a you know, open economy basis, um, you know, free enterprise and so on. The other diametrically different approach being central bank centric. And yet the, the, the winning formula is, is acceptability and that the people uh, use the infrastructure freely. Just give us a sense of uh, how successful has it been so far? How do you measure your um, your rollout? Uh, how many downloads of the apps have you had? Um, you know, what is the average transaction per day? Um, you know, th and how many customers do you yeah. think you have? Um, it, it's, a, it's a bit too early to measure that. And I think the successful criteria is to have users be able to send money smoothly to anyone in the whole system uh, without having to worry. So in terms of the download, as I said, Bakong doesn't exist on its own. So even if I were to count the number of download of the Bakong app, 
um, it is unfair to assess the success of background based on that because for banks who have embedded background into their application, automatically um, that will be counted towards the usage of background as well. So it's not just the app download, but the usage of the of, of, of the system of the platform. Um, and so if we, if we were to count, you know, all the member banks in background, I will have to add every of their uh, their, their, their users um, to the uh, solo uh, download of Bacong. Um, I don't have that number, but it, it very easily exceeds the millions. Do I assume that Bacong is being funded by Japanese, um, um, oh. you know, J Japanese aid money? It's co-developed by the National Bank of Cambodia and a Japanese company. So we co-own the IP and everything funded by the central bank. And then, but your retail pay is um, is with a Korean technology company. Do you think that there might be, uh, you know, issues there that you might be championing two conflicting um, technologies? These are complementing um, system. There may be some overlap that we need to resolve, um, but definitely um, it, it's complementing each other. Why didn't you go all the way and just centralize? fiat money anyway, um, you know, um, and make it digital completely. That, that, that would have solved all your problem with the different infrastructure that you need to put in place. I think nobody knows what could be the end consequences of a CBDC, right? People are still studying it. Um, and I, I, I won't claim that we're the smartest and, and we, we found a solution, therefore we're going to do it first. In our circumstances, there's no use of it. And a lot of the question I got asked is that why is it a developing country like Cambodia introduced the uh, CBDC? All I know is that I've got a, a, a problem that I want to solve and this technology is there. Um, were we specifically targeting DLT, Hyperledger, Iroha, whatever? And, right. and and that it works, I mean, this technology can provide me with the solutions and therefore we go along with it. And that's the only reason um, we use it. Um, and it's, and then again, I, when you knew it, why don't we just go through a, you know, a CBDC? I mean, legally, we can't hold individual account at the central bank. We need to change the law. Um, yeah. For us right now, we don't need it. Why would we want to complicate our life with something that, you know. What is your relationship with the telcos in Cambodia? Um, why couldn't they have been a platform themselves? You know, what's your conversation with them? Many of the telco here has their own payment service provider. They're, they're already part of this conversation. Um, and it, it's interesting because, I mean, there's argument about, you know, you license the service and not the institutions. Um, we chose, um, I mean, somewhere in between where we, we license the institution. So if the telco want to do that kind of services, they have to set up a separate entity specifically doing that. It is better that we work with the payment service provider because they are directly under our oversight than we work with a telco who would be, you know, under the um, telco regulator. So it's, it will be very conflicting and the coordinating will be more uh, challenging. Which countries do you look at uh, for modeling uh, your approach? Uh, which countries are most interesting to you as a regulator? In 2009, when we first tried to, you know, come up with um, a, a way to regulate the, the first payment service provider that was going to be operating in the country, um, the IFC, um, the World Bank, um, has uh, assisted us in uh, doing some study visits. Three countries that were chosen. Uh, one was Kenya, which is a very freely operating, you know, payment service provider, very little regulation from the central bank. And then a South African country where it was very strictly uh, regulated. And then we visited uh, the Philippines, which was something in between. And I think we sort of model ourselves towards the, the Philippines model with the tweak to, uh, to our own local context. What are the milestones that you're giving yourself, uh, both for Bakong and the payments infrastructure as a, it, uh, as a whole? I think at the end of the day, is to have these two systems complementing each other. Um, and the banks are good with, you know, credits and deposits. Um, I mean, there, there can be, some of them can be very good with the payment um, service as well, some added service, but they're not really making any money. The payment service provider, on the other hand, are actually making money out of these services. 
they're actually more innovative in, 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 in creating a value added service. Um, for instance, on um, payment scoring. Um, so I, I sit on the Cambodian uh, Credit Bureau as well as the chairperson. At the moment, we have a um, credit history and then we create a scoring out of that. Um, but what if we also add alternative data and have a payment history um, added to the scoring, right? <laughs> Why not, you know, let the payment service provider do what they are doing and, and, and do it even better? Let the bank do what they're doing, doing, uh, you know, better and, you know, have bring them all together and, and complement each other. As I said, interoperability, complementarity among the different players, that's really important. Last question. You know, a lot of the uh, innovations taking place in, um, in payments, um, the excuse given is uh, to reach the unbanked, to, you know, to, to make um, uh, finance available to the masses and so on. But the truth is that um, in all of these areas, payments is actually expensive. You know, it's, uh, and the more technology you put into it, the more expensive it becomes. So... Um, a lot of these so-called, you know, startups, um, fintechs, uh, and the venture capitalists behind them—they're not looking at making it cheaper. They're making, they're looking at making money from it, real money. You know, you are in 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 a country where this is exactly what is happening. Uh, everyone sees payments as a revenue-generating um, business um, to be pursued, not to go out and make, you know, uh, life easy for the masses and so on. So what is your sense of the commercial aspect of payment? So there is the interoperability part that's going to push competition uh, stronger. But what really bothers me is that a lot of the fintech companies, some are doing really good and I, I appreciate that, but a lot would, like you said, use the financial inclusion as a selling point of their yep. product. Yep. And so you've got a lot of venture capitalists putting money into those projects. Um, with the belief that they are helping the unbanked and actually not necessarily because they're helping the, the, the tech company, the founders, the investors, but they're not helping the unbanked. So this is the supply part of it. What haven't been done is on the demand side of it, right? That the customer, nobody invests in um, educating people about the usage of digital devices. Nobody educate the customer or the user about financial, so financial literacy, digital literacy, very little investment. You keep pushing this on the supply side. You keep pushing all this product without considering what is the consequences on the demand side. And at the end of the day, if you're pushing the wrong thing to the people, you're creating risk much bigger than just access. I mean, access is one, usage is two. If you access and you misuse it, then the, 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 I mean, the consequences is even worse. It's actually, um, and take you, you know, a step back to, to your initial objective. So that's what really upset me is that very few venture capitalists or those who or, or development fund actually goes into the demand side, which is the people who are ultimately benefiting. And money keep flowing billions and billions of dollars into these uh, tech company and, and thinking that it's going to help these people, and it's not. This interview with Chair Sari, the Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia, um, has um, given us an insight on several points. And she clarified that, uh, that Bakong is not a central bank uh, digital currency, uh, despite uh, you know, everything that is being said uh, in media around the world. Um, and perhaps more important, that the challenge that she has uh, is more a business challenge rather than a technology challenge. Cambodia is a marketplace with more than 20 payment system players, each of them uh, having invested money and wanting to dominate uh, the payments infrastructure, uh, from which a project like Bakong decommercializes the payment infrastructure because it's being delivered almost free and so on. And on top of that, it's interesting to see in the near future how Bakong will evolve if the retail payment infrastructure becomes um, viable and becomes operational because the retail pay network is uh, bank centric and Bakong is uh, meant to be peer to peer. All countries go through um, an evolution in their payment infrastructure. The more unbanked a country is, the more uh, ready it is for a Bakong or a M-Pesa type 
platform. And as the country becomes increasingly progressively banked, uh, the population becomes more dependent on a um, bank-centric platform and network and backbone. Cambodia has another problem, which is the fact that uh, it has two operating currencies, the dollar and the domestic real. Um, and so the validation of a platform is also a validation of the more dominant, the more um, acceptable, the more uh, popular uh, currency in operation. And it's, very, it's unique in that, in that only a few countries have this as an issue. Um, and so on top of that uh, is, uh, are the players who are delivering on the project and how they will evolve. So we know, for example, that uh, there is a um, Japanese company that is uh, you know, trying to put its technology on the ground uh, through the Bakong project, and then a Korean company that is working out uh, the retail pay platform. And how these two initiatives will evolve um, remains to be seen. Uh, at the back of the scene um, is the political process in Cambodia, where because it's a growing economy, um, the political process uh, has opened up the financial uh, infrastructure to any number of players from anywhere in the world uh, who want to contribute to building capital and, uh, and financial access uh, in Cambodia. Uh, and without losing momentum on that, to build an infrastructure that is both ubiquitous and um, interoperable. So these are the challenges that Cambodia has. And I think that's what we've been able to capture in this interview with the assistant governor.